So my understanding of astrological magic was hugely influenced by a text I read many years ago. And this text is called Pop Culture Magic by Elwood. And in this text, Elwood says that when there is a character, right? When like, for example, why do so many people resonate with Star Trek? Why do people dress up as Star Trek characters or Star Wars characters? What is it that is happening here? Well, according to Elwood, he believes that that is actually an ancient deity that is desiring to be known in a modern context. And he says that when it is that we acknowledge and are able to see the living myth, the mythological divine energy manifesting in these pop culture figures, we're able to that much more tap into the sacredness and the mythology and the mythologicizing of our own lives. And I thought this was a very powerful theory. He has a very eclectic approach to magic, and so do I as well. And so just like Elwood uh, inspires us to consider how it is that myth and divine energies are playing out constantly in our own lives, I do believe that we do this as astrologers with the sky, with the planets for me in particular. Some people do it more connecting with the mythologies of the signs, but for me, it's very much about the planets and understanding uh, their divine origin. And in this way, we as astrologers become better astrologers when it is that we are cultivating a relationship with these divine energies. But if we have to be very straightforward about it and to define astrological magic, a very clear definition is, Astrological magic is essentially the desire to manifest your intention, utilizing ritual performed at key celestial moments to make that magic, to make your ritual that much more effective and that much more powerful. And so when we practice astrological magic, that is a part of what we are doing. We are essentially seeking to align the moment of ritual, of the ask with astrological phenomenon so that we can have the energy of the astrological phenomenon to see it through towards an outcome and towards manifestation. But ultimately, the way that manifestation works, and this has been said again and again, it is part of the mystery. If you are willing to see it, you will see your intention manifesting everywhere, but it takes the willingness to see it. And that is what it means to see with a magical lens. And so now we're going to move on to Plato. Um, you know, it is argued that the entire uh, foundation of Western thought rests on the shoulders of three men, and that is Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. Now, this is argued by academics, but we can see how there certainly is a lineage uh, in modern Western thought, and we can see how it is the, the ideas of Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates that is an important foundation to modern Western thought. <clears throat> the thing to remember, though, is, see, when I was an undergrad, we had to read Plato every year. Every year we were looking at different texts of Plato. And it wasn't until I got to graduate school and my uh, program, Cosmology and Divination, was taught with the School of uh, Religious Studies, uh, the Faculty of Religious Studies, rather. And it wasn't until then that we looked at these texts again and understood that actually these were deeply spiritual, deeply mystical men. And so much of what it is that they are affirming, so much of their reasoning ultimately rests in an understanding of mystical phenomenon, we can call it. And Plato in particular, we see and we read Plato again and again. He was a student of Socrates, and he has been hugely influential because he has this, um, this theory of source, of a singular source from which all of existence came from. And this idea of source was later picked up on by later monotheists. So when we as a huge swath of humanity, of course not all, but a huge swath of humanity, started moving away from the notion of many gods and towards the notion of a singular god, 
it was many of these early monotheists. In particular, I'm thinking about early Christian philosophers, early Islamic philosophers, who looked at the thoughts of Plato to further affirm what it is that they think. So it was like to further affirm the validity of what they were asserting in terms of the validity of a monotheistic God. But what Plato actually said was uh, more nuanced, of course. And we can see what he understood about and, and some of the philosophy behind astrological magic by looking at two of his more important texts that are very blatantly mystical, blatantly spiritual. That is Timaeus and Epinomis. And so Timaeus presents a mystical understanding of the origin of the world and of the universe. Epinomis builds on that and considers why it is so important to contemplate the cosmos. So in, in Timaeus, for us, uh, those of us who are open to astrological magic, want to explore astrological magic, Plato conceptualized what he called vital chains. So it's essentially this idea that there is source and from source emanates these, what he called vital chains. And they go to, they go through all these realms of spirit and then their first physical manifestation, these singular chains first manifest as something uh, real, something physical in the planets. And in this way, the planets are um, especially notable because they are the first physical manifestation of that source energy, what we today would call God or the divine, you know, the singular divine. It is the physical planets themselves that become the first physical manifestation of God. And in this way, they are especially important to Plato, especially exalted. From those physical planets, those vital chains come forward and they connect to everyone and everything that exists in the universe, including here on Earth. So as an astrologer, I will give you an example for those of us who are, and I would think all of us here are astrologers. And certainly if you're an astrologer, you are forever a student of astrology as well. We can think of the sun, right? The sun connects to the sign of Leo and that vital chain comes down and connects to all kinds of things here on earth. And what are some of those things? It connects to gold. It connects to sunflowers, right? It connects to our heart on a physical level. So it is essentially this vital chain that moves from source, from the ultimate divine energy forward through vital chain manifests physically first in the planet and then that vital chain comes down and moves through the constellation moves through all of the substances here on earth and in this way everything as part of our physical reality of our physical manifestation is in some way connected by a vital chain and in some way every vital chain is ultimately connected to each of the planets and each of the planets by vital chains is connected to source energy, is connected to the divine and the ultimate divine energy. And so a lot of his correspondences were also based on elements, not to make it too much about, you know, what I'm doing here, but actually my book that, um, that David mentioned earlier, The Body and the Cosmos, that is me taking the ideas Plato presents in Timaeus and applying it to an astrological sky. So he doesn't say, oh, this is the sign of Leo in the Timaeus, but we as astrological magical practitioners, we as astrologers certainly are able to make those connections. It's quite blatant in some cases. And so that's what I decided to do in this book, The Body and the Cosmos, um, and includes meditations as well, which is why I always start my classes with meditation. But this is very valuable for us to consider the idea of correspondence itself. And he believed that all of matter is infused in spirit. And even though we can say the sunflower is infused with the energy of the sun, ultimately the sunflower is infused with the energy of source, of divine itself. 